hope you're doing well and staying safe. Uh, thank you so much for joining from across the world for the session, the business case for a circular textiles economy at the third CIF conclave. I'm Siddharth Ullah, lead corporate strategy and enterprise engagement for the Circular Apparel Innovation Factory, an industry-led initiative driven by IntelliCap and supported by anchor partners, Dune Foundation and other people of fashion retail with a mission to build the ecosystem and capabilities required to transition towards the circular textiles and apparel industry in India, as well as the rest of Southeast Asia. Uh, in order to make this a very meaningful conversation, this session includes a panel discussion by prominent voices in the circular economy space, followed by an enterprise showcase by extremely promising circular innovations across the textile and apparel value chain. Uh, as a context, I would like to share that uh, the potential of the circular economy continues to grow exponentially in the textile and apparel industry. We are seeing brands increasingly look to adopt circular business models. However, there are many real perceived as well as uh, you know, real challenges associated with this adoption. One such barrier is a lack of a clear evidence of the financial viability. Alternatively, a circular business model that looks great on the balance sheet, but does not have positive people and planned outcomes will ultimately fail to meet its full potential. Hence, for circular business models to be widely adapted and scaled, an understanding of what a true business case means in the context of the circular economy is critical. And uh, friends, this is more so in the context of manufacturing countries in Southeast Asia, like India, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh. Uh, hence, you know, as key outcomes for the session, we aim to define and develop an understanding of what the meaning of a true business case is. Second, also highlight key challenges and areas of interventions required to accelerate this transition. I would now like to take this opportunity to introduce our panelists and thank them for taking the time out from their extremely busy schedules and being so forthcoming with us and participating for the session. For the panel we have with us, Dr. Rene Van, uh, Van Berkel. Dr. Rene heads the regional office for UNIDO in India. He's accredited as the UNIDO representative for India, Bhutan, Maldives, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. Gwen Cunningham. Gwen leads Circle Economies Textiles Program, which has the mission to achieve a zero waste industry through the implementation of circular solutions along with its network partners or brands and solution providers. Freya Vermeer, Freya's program manager of the Dune Foundation. Her focus is on the circular economy as well as food sustainability. Mr. Edwin K. Edwin is the CEO of the Hong Kong Research Institute of Textile and Apparel, HK Data. Uh, and you know, you'll be really glad to know that the impact of his work has been such that Edwin was also awarded the Medal of Honor in 2020 by the Hong Kong government for his research work during the pandemic. Harsha Vardhan. Harsha leads circular, Circularity Leap at H&M Group and plays a very important role in H&M Group's future growth plans and the leap intended to accelerate this transition through the, throughout the entire company. And Gigi Matthews, uh, Gigi is the country director of OnView India and as part of her role, spearheads OnView Circularity Agenda for textiles in India to create, validate and grow innovative circular solutions. Gigi has also been very gracious in accepting to moderate the session and we're really thankful for that, Gigi. Uh, before I hand it over to Gigi, just a few ground rules, you know, for the audiences, uh, you know, for us to, you know, encourage better participation. Uh, you know, request all the audiences to keep yourself on mute while the session is going on. Please feel free to add any questions for the panelists in the chat box. And if it's devoted to a specific panelist, you know, please feel, feel free to mention the name as, the, as well. And lastly, we'd love to know you. So do share a bit about your background in the chat and get to know your fellow participants. Thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Gigi. Thank you, Siddharth. It's great to be here with an impressive panel who connect the dots on the topic in hand. And I love that the audience is growing. It's fantastic to have all of you here. Embracing circularity in the textile industry is not really an option anymore, but it's an urgent imperative. So there's already pressure. So the pressure is on to consume less energy, use fewer resources and produce less waste. But it's also important to scale and profitable if we, uh, to be profitable if we want to make this work. So we have seen that conversation has started moving from CSR corridors to finance decision makers. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna engage our panel who will bring us together and bring to us in all its powerful form, the crux of the session that sustainability is good business. Gwen, I'm gonna open the floor to you. Circle Economy, as we all know, is an impact organization and I, do, and I know is doing a lot to make the transition to circular economy. Uh, while you share the key objectives for circular economy towards this transition, 
we would really also like to hear some examples of circular business models that have emerged from your textile program, and especially the ones that presented a strong commercialization opportunity. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me and great to be a part of this panel. So yeah, maybe first a little bit about circular economy and specifically the textiles program, which I lead. So we are an impact organization based at Amsterdam and working primarily with businesses, cities and nations to help them make the transition to the circular economy. Now within the textiles program, which uh, has been around since 2014 and was the first kind of sector initiative within the organization, our mission is around achieving a zero waste industry. But we kind of approach that to two distinct lenses. So on one hand, we're looking at the existing waste in the system um, and we have a pillar of the program called Reduce the Mountain. So how do we build the technology, the data, the infrastructure that we need to valorize textile waste at scale? And on the other hand, we recognize that to only do that would be quite um, reactive. So we have a second pillar of the program called Prevent the Mountain, which is working primarily with uh, brands and manufacturers and really asking the question, how do we move uh, away from a system that generates waste? So how do we integrate circular design principles across the board? And how do we uh, launch circular business models that can actually um, uphold and support the lifetime extension of products? So these two, uh, these two things side by side, which as you can imagine means that we're working all across the value chain, with collectors, sorters, recyclers, brands, manufacturers, et cetera. I think um, the programs that we've been working on that have been the largest in the past few years, have maybe two that I can mention. One has been uh, the development of the fiber sort technology. So this is a machine um, in the end of use supply chain that can source uh, post-consumer textile waste based on fiber composition using uh, near infrared technology. And that's kind of one of these uh, pre-processing technologies that will hopefully open the floodgates for large scale textile to textile recycling. On the other hand, from a kind of more of a brand perspective, one of the big um, projects, and I think from a commercialization perspective, one of the areas which I think is a very hot topic at the moment is around circular business models. So specifically rental and resale. Um, we know that those markets are growing exponentially at the moment, they're, they're booming. Um, resale in particular is, I think, got an annual growth rate of 36% compared to you know, traditional retail, which is about 3% at the moment. And all estimations are saying that it's going to outpace fast fashion within the next 10 years. So uh, I think when I look at the brands that we work with, that's one of the areas where they're getting very excited about kind of the, the opportunity to not sell their product once, but sell it two, three, four or five times. Now, there's a whole host of challenges there and the business case is dependent on very specific levers. Maybe we can jump into that uh, in a bit more detail. But I think that space of circular business models is one where, um, from a, a business case perspective, there's a huge amount of energy and potential right now. Um, but of course, it always has to be seen in balance, right? The, the promise of those business models is that you're going to increase the utilization of the garment and that you're going to ultimately start to displace the need for new production and new consumption. So how do we actually ensure that they you know, they deliver on, let's say, the environmental and the social impact benefits that they promise, and that they can actually start to cannibalize and displace uh, the primary business model. Thank so you. very much in brief. Thank you, Gwen. But there's one more thing I want to, uh, you know, ask you is like, yes, uh, most of these solutions you said has to deliver on the environmental and the social side. And the other part is to make it sustainable. That means we need to look at the business case. So how would you define uh, the business case of the various solutions that you're looking at? Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to hashing this out with the panel today because I think it's such a sticking point and one that doesn't get enough um, attention. I think when we at Circle Economy look at the business case, we often talk about kind of the um, the linear risks. So what is the, the, the business risk of not moving? Um, you know, that these, these companies that are now working in this take make waste approach, they are exposed to a variety of risks that are now often overlooked, or they're not kind of um, present in traditional risk evaluation approaches. And that's, of course, you know, the utilization of, of non renewable resources and that over dependency 
on those finite resources. It's, you know, the, the designing single use um, and uh, uh, short lifetime products that will, you know, inevitably end up in, in waste or incineration. It's oftentimes a failure to collaborate um, and kind of a, a um, yeah, a inability to, to share and uh, exchange knowledge and also a failure to adapt and innovate. So those are what we think of as the linear risks. And I think the opportunity for for circular business models is really to mitigate those risks, so to reduce that dependency on uh, on Virgin and hedge, I suppose, your kind of um, your bets against any volatility issues that are coming down the line. You know, the ability to really innovate on the products and the services that you offer, and therefore increase your competitive advantage. And finally, also, you know, the I suppose the potential to um, in prioritizing the environmental and the social aspects alongside your business case, that you're better uh, equipped to deal with the regulations that are most uh, probably coming down the line and the reputational risk and the negative perception that we see you know, emerging because of the consumer um, awareness that is growing. So I think the, yeah, that, that for me is the potential, let's say business case of, of the circular economy is the ability to mitigate those linear risks that we currently are faced with, but don't often recognize. Yes, and while you, you know, spoke about the potential of the business case, I think you also touched upon the challenges, which I will circle back to you a little later on this. Thank you, Gwen. Uh, Dr. Rene, Unido is increasingly focusing on circular economy and of course the industrial development opportunities that this brings. You lead India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, all high producing countries in the textile industry. So while you start off uh, you know, with the key objectives of Unido in this country, it, it would also be great you know, uh, to also talk about your definition of a true business case in line with what Gwen has already started. Yes, uh, thank you, Migi, and uh, uh, good afternoon to all, or good morning, wherever you are. So it's uh, indeed a pleasure to contribute on behalf of the UNIDO, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. That's a mouthful. We are basically the specialized agency in the UN that supports uh, the developing countries and middle-income countries on industrialization issues. And uh, in the context of uh, the sustainable development goals that we have right now, our mandate is inclusive and sustainable industrial development, or SDG 9. And I think that is, uh, that, that is best uh, translated as, as saying that we are looking at industrialization that works for markets because there's uh, products and, and services being delivered that are sought after in the market and they have a good quality. That uh, works also for people and communities so that uh, decent conditions of work and decent uh, engagements with the communities. And that also observes and exceeds environmental rules and regulations. So it's basically factories that are fit for the future because they have addressed the challenges of the past. So we work across a diversity of sectors of industry sectors, including uh, textile and apparel, uh, in, the, in issues which are contributing to the circular economy transition, I would say in a broader sense, not necessarily just exclusively circular economy, but very much com continuing to that. So if I just mention uh, uh, maybe for, from four countries in, the, in Asia, some examples, uh, I think in India, if I, if I start close to my current home, uh, we have an ongoing program in, uh, on energy efficiency and uh, which uh, is the textile processing center, sector. So uh, we focus, for example, on Surat, which is a main uh, processing center for uh, uh, polyester dyeing and, and finishing. And we work there on the standardization of energy efficient technology Technologies, so we take out a risk for the uh, manuf for the uh, uh, operators to which technology to buy to then die, try to build procure this equipment so we bring the cost down and then we provide the financing through ESCO mechanisms so on energy service on energy savings so current work is they are focusing then on issues like any efficient compressors micro turbines uh, PLC controls and so on these are technologies which are well known and achieve energy and other savings so water uh, water chemicals and improve also quality and productivity with space back times well within two years many many even as close to one years this makes a good business sense and a similar uh, pilot is also ongoing in the Varanasi region in Uttar Pradesh in India, which is famous for its handwoven series and Kadi. Uh, and there we focus on the combustion control, low grade heat recovery and the automation of the uh, dyeing process. So if I just jump across to Sri Lanka, uh, where we have uh, our partner, the National Clean Production Center, uh, with, with which you need has been working on, on chemicals management, and in particular on, the, on alternative business models for supply 
applying chemicals to textile processes for their textile process and also for wastewater treatment based on chemicals leasing. So you basically go to a performance-based uh, business model. This has uh, been very successful in reducing costs and also reducing chemicals use and then also reducing wastewater discharges. And this experience is currently upscaled and re replicated in other parts of the world, in Egypt, uh, Morocco, Tunisia, Ethiopia, amongst others. In my uh, earlier work, I go maybe three, four years ago, I was working in Indonesia and we worked on the, on the concept of resource efficient and cleaner production. So that's basically saying that we need maximum value out of every liter of water, every kilowatt hour of energy and every every kilogram of material, and then we have less waste uh, to throw away. Uh, so this resource efficient and clean production is really a, a self-nurturing cycle, uh, where we also improve the productivity and employee health and situations there. We, we worked with uh, several uh, brand, brand fashion manufacturers there, and annual savings in the sector due to resource efficient and clean production were in the range between $50,000 a year to $1 million a year. These were possible through a combination of water savings, up to 40% in specific water consumption. And this has multiple benefits and also in terms of wastewater treatment, energy savings up to 20% in power and up to 40% in coal use and chemicals, in some cases, up to 20% in reduction of chemicals. If I then go even further, uh, maybe back to uh, work which we did in, in, in Vietnam as another example of the work we are working doing in the textile sector was really focusing on the handicrafts in the silk uh, sector, where we uh, had a collaborative project to improve the silk varieties and so that the, the strength of the silk is better, that it can be easier spun and, and, uh, and woven, and also improve the dyeing processes using uh, uh, natural colors, which are available from, uh, from flowers and wax, uh, tree materials, which are available locally. So that is uh, some of, uh, of the work that uh, Unido has been do doing, mostly on the, I would say, on the manufacturing side and the production side of uh, textiles and garments apparel. And I think there the business case is in the, in the traditional way. So the business case for processes would clearly be on, uh, on, on immediate cost savings. If I say uh, one and a half, two years uh, payback, that is, uh, that's good enough as an investor. So there should be no issue that this, uh, this should be done. And I think the other part of it is for those uh, processes that in part there is the, also the, uh, the, the uh, market or the brand, uh, brands pushing for uh, uh, improvements in the particularly on the, on the chemicals with the vol voluntary sustainability standards like the um, uh, zero emissions of hazardous chemicals uh, and other approaches, which are really saying that uh, to the, uh, these processes, if you don't eliminate these uh, chemicals out of your value, out of your processes, you can't be supplying to these brands. Uh, I think that is a relatively narrow interpretation of the business case, but I think maybe we can come back to the business case in a, in a, in a, in a follow-up uh, conversation on what is actually the business case in a broader sense. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rene. I think just hearing you speak and the details given has moved the needle towards the transition, and that has been ex excellent information. Um, you know, uh, while we look at, uh, you know, the different uh, initiatives and projects that uh, UNIDO is part of, I'm just curious to know, uh, you know, because Siddharth was mentioning that one of the main reasons uh, when we look at the business case in the circular textile economy is the lack of it. There's no, there's no lack of, you know, there's lack of evidence. But you have presented across definite evidence to show that there is transition to it and also the scale of this. Uh, what do you think, in your opinion, you know, taking off from that, that there's lack of evidence and is there really uh, a business case that we can build upon in the move, in the transition towards circular economy? I'd love to hear your view on this. Yes, yes, uh, thank you very much. And I, th I think it's, it's, it's very difficult to say what's the business case for circular economy because the circular economy is also very different uh, solutions which are there. So there are clearly solutions in the business and the circular economy space which have a good and a narrow focused uh, a business case which you can explain to your chief finance officer because it's just dollars in, less dollars, or more dollars in, less dollars out kind of approach. And that is on this uh, processing side. I think there, there are other aspects and there are other aspects of the circular economy, which are perhaps more difficult to explain. And they, they, those require a more larger and wider uh, an understanding of what is a business case. Uh, so, 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 so may, maybe I, I, I mean I can uh, can elaborate if you wish, or we can leave that a little bit later after each of the panelists has been introduced. Yes. I think that's a good idea, but I'm going to come right back to you on that. Yes, yes, yes. A pleasure. Thank you. But it should not get a monologue. <laughs> 
<laughs> of course, I, I want Freya to come on board right now. Freya, uh, you know, the Dune Foundation is not a stranger, especially to Sankalp and of course for NVU and KEF. And you have been working very closely with, uh, you know, early innovation and being catalytic when it comes to bringing these innovations and technologies in the forefront. Uh, so while you introduce, uh, you know, or, or talk about the key, um, you know, highlights or the focus of the Dune Foundation, what would be, you know, a great if you also tell us about, uh, you know, the focus on supporting these innovative initiatives and entrepreneurs from Dune in, in the sense that I know that you do the early stage program and, and entrepreneurs that you support, what next and the gap that you see? You're on mute, I think. Sorry, already started to talk. Uh, thank you, uh, Gigi. So yes, the Dune Foundation has been set up 30 years ago by the Dutch uh, charity lotteries in the Netherlands. And we envisage actually a society that is more greener, creative and social. Uh, and we do that by, by actually supporting more entrepreneurial initiatives. So it can be directly funding uh, initiatives in the Netherlands, partly also in East Africa and in India. Within my portfolio, so I'm a program manager for circular entrepreneurship. And that was actually also a focus we brought in, I think, three years ago, because we already know actually that circular economy is a quite well-known concept, but there's quite a lack of really uh, cases in practice and also innovation that really shows that you can make the change and that you can do it as an entrepreneur as well. So we started three years ago with supporting more initiatives, particularly on circular entrepreneurship. And it is why we also partnered with uh, CIF to support particularly the ecosystem. So it's either initiatives that are entrepreneur startups or it are more ecosystem builders like CIF. Um, what we see in general, so we are really a philanthropic fund and, and also an impact investment fund that wants to um, contribute to entrepreneurs, but really with the innovation. So it should be about innovation, it should be about a scalable model, and it should be also that we as a funder can have a catalytic role. And to maybe elaborate on your particular question, what we see, I think, is that there's still quite a big financing gap of the role where we in as we as supporting the early phase like the it's no it's beyond of course initiatives that only have done research but they are already there they're in the markets and then we can just give them an extra push but then it should be also to other funders to kind of take a little bit more risk than they are maybe used to especially banks and then also of course the impact investors that often also come in at a later stage. So what we still experience is just the lack of patient capital, which is very much needed, especially now, and also especially probably because of the impact of COVID. It takes for innovations much longer to really prove themselves. And I think also if you talk about, you know, scaling up, especially on the initiatives that work in the textile and apparel uh, sector with bigger brands and manufacturing companies, it really takes a long time. I mean, it, it asks a lot from both sides, from startups, but also from the, from the bigger companies to make a cooperation between them uh, successful. So you need either also really uh, investments from both sides in time, in in uh, in patience, but then also from the funder perspective. And yeah, we definitely still see a role as Doom in this particular sector, but also for other stakeholders. And we really hope, and we already experienced so far that CIF CIF has a very important role to play in. Thank you, Freya, for that. I think even within NBU and the projects that have been working with you. Uh, you know, patient capital is the need of the hour because, you know, while uh, Dune Foundation has been very catalytic in bringing these, you know, innovative solutions and technologies forward, which will make that trans transition to a circular world, you know, we end up then being, as a venture, too large for Dune Foundation to still give the early stage support 
but too small for impact invest investments, which means that they're not willing to take that risk uh, you know, to help towards that scale. I think that was a very important point you have brought about. Um, Freya, uh, one thing I want to uh, bring about and ask you is about mud jeans. I know that, uh, you know, is a, an excellent example to give our audience about how Doom Foundation supported that transition. Yeah, yes, that's, that's a very good one. Um, so mud jeans, we, we funded them from the start. So um, they are very successful at the moment with recycling of jeans. So they are achieving a high quality jeans, but also on a 99% basis of recycling, which is not always the case for a lot of other brands that also say they use recycled materials. Um, but also in, in this particular case, it took them quite a long time, of course, like, like all others, because you have to compete with the bigger brands so that it's, it's really a, a long and a hard road to take, but which is very nice to mention now, maybe the audience already seen it, but they just recently launched a partnership with IKEA. And that actually is a great example of how uh, two companies can cooperate, especially also for IKEA, it's a very good way to do a kind of co-branding because they can also show the consumers what it means to have a more more awareness to create more awareness about circularity they can directly bring in their genes and ikea collects them and they also see directly what happens with the genes because mud genes is actually making material out of these genes to have a cover of a sofa so it's also i think a very interesting way of cooperation because it shows that mud is not only actually delivering a very good product but they also specialize themselves in really developing a recycled material that can be used in different ways for different partners in the sector. So I think that is very hopeful and, op and also hopefully very inspiring for others to, uh, to cooperate. And there are of course many examples in our portfolio and um, we just hope that it, you know, there will be a bigger push and there will be also more commitment of different stakeholders to make these kind of cooperation work. Yes, thanks, Freya. I think that brings about a very important aspect to also, you know, moving towards the transition is about the partnership and the collaborations that need to be on the ground. Thank you, Freya. I'm going to move to Harsha. Harsha, you are the man of the hour when it comes to the brand because you're the only one right here who's representing a brand. So I think um, the most important thing is one, of course, the key objectives for H&M in this transition. And you know, defining that true business case from the H&M, you know, perspective, that would be something that, uh, you know, and in fact, I saw some questions on chat about that. And also you can move into, you know, examples of initiatives taken by H&M to support and scale circular innovation. Okay, thank you, Gigi. Uh, um, we have been working with sustainability for a long time, um, but circularity is, even though it is not a new concept, but the way it has been understood uh, is, is changing uh, constantly. And for us as H&M, you know, the, the turning point in the last couple of years is when uh, our new CEO took over, Helena Helmershan. Uh, some of you know, she used to be head of sustainability. And for somebody who was heading sustainability to become head of CEO, uh, part uh, CEO is, is a big thing. And at least I don't know any company of, of this size who has done that. And the first thing she spoke about is meaningful growth. Uh, when we want to grow, I mean, we of course have to grow, but it has to be meaningful. And we all recognize internally that circularity is one of that tool which will take us towards meaningful growth. So there is a lot of focus on circularity. Uh, not just because it is our responsibility, uh, but it is also because it makes good business sense. We have been a, a 75 year old company and if you want to survive for another 70 years, we cannot survive the way we have been doing business. I mean, it has to be something different. Uh, and circularity gives us that opportunity to change uh, and transform ourselves and hopefully together with other partners, the whole industry. Uh, and looking at business case discussion, this is very interesting because we all have gut feeling is that circularity is good, uh, but we are still struggling to put numbers, uh, still struggling to go to CFO and ask for 
funds specifically for for uh, circularity because uh, we haven't come up with business case in the way we normally do for other business areas and that is i think one of our biggest challenge um, but so far what we understood there are three parts of our business one is raw materials uh, and the second is how uh, garments or fashion is produced and the third one is how you interact with uh, with our customers you know selling and and uh, the overall interaction and in all three areas circularity has a huge role to play um i think it's gwen who touched upon you know virgin uh, our reliance on on virgin material uh, we are very old industry but we are constantly dependent on agriculture for our cotton food industry for our leather and wool and petroleum industry for our polyester and nylon so we have almost no control on raw material because it's coming from somewhere else circularity gives us that opportunity uh, to control raw materials and, and create raw materials through recycling for example uh, how it is manufactured dr rene um, uh, mentioned quite a lot of initiatives that unido is doing which is not only to reduce impact and use less energy but also look at new way of producing fabrics you know new way of dyeing or printing which we have not done for many years and how you interact with with customers is is circular business models uh, all our business all along has been about selling and and uh, you know we wait for customers to come back but there is a scope of constantly interacting with our customers through products uh, what we call a life cycle journey of a product uh, and that is something we need to do a lot more so on all three areas there are huge opportunities and there are business cases around circularity Uh, I can give you some examples if um, you would like Please me to continue. Go ahead. Please go ahead with the example, Hasha. Um, so let's let's look at virgin uh, material part. Um, we have our uh, collab, which is uh, our investment wing, uh, and we have been investing in different kind of uh, startups. Uh, and majority of those investments are into recycled materials. Uh, five of them. Uh, we have been investing for last ten years now, uh, and we. are hoping that all five of them will come to scale in next 4 to 5 years and if that happens uh the way we look at materials will completely change because we are talking about taking waste or end of life products and converting it back into products uh virgin kind of uh, products um it's a long way to go it's um, we are still a lot of technical uh, challenges but i think 4 to 5 years you will see big change there Uh, we have invested in two companies um, alchemy and uh, colorifix who are specifically about uh, dyeing process uh, when it comes to manufacturing because that is where the biggest climate impact is uh, and we hope that these two uh, startups when they grow up uh, they will revolutionize how we will dye fabrics in the future and then there is a lot of things happening in circular business model one example is selpi uh, we invested in that company few years ago now we, we have launched it in 17 different markets in europe which is about uh, you know reselling um, uh, customer to customer or customer to business and then we are looking into how to scale it up and there are a lot more opportunities in circular business model we are just touching the surface right now thank you harsha i'm going to circle back to you about one more question which is about you know in this whole transition as a brand and when you work closely with manufacturers um you know how do you get them to also you know have the same passion or the same focus and vision as a brand and also do you know direct customers have a say in this you know so that i'm going to circle back and how it influences that i'm coming to you edwin uh, hk rita fosters technology and advancement innovation and breakthroughs of course in order to improve global competitiveness and uh, brands and large manufacturers have partnered with hk rita and and that tells us what the movement on the ground is so i would you know the question to you would be yes while you talk about you know the focus and the key indications from hk vita towards this transition but you know there was a point you made to me yesterday that first movers will reap the bulk of the benefits i want you to touch upon that too as we move forward right yeah thank thanks for for bringing that that point up i i think that um for a long time uh, one of the things that, that that we talked about yesterday too as we observe this whole um this whole change in the in fashion and business models 
is that for a long time, we were talking about this subject of circularity, sustainability as a, as a CSR function of, of, uh, of a company. This is something we do out of the goodness of our hearts. But then we, have, we came to a point in which we began to see that this is something that makes good business sense. It is something that can drive long-term business. And, and so the change there is to figure out what that new business model look like and how can we get there faster than anybody else. Uh, one way to, to think about this would be that if we think about a couple of years ago, when we think of circularity, we were mostly thinking about things like how do we recycle more, how do we uh, produce less waste, uh, and so on and so forth. And, and it was a way of reducing the impact that we were making or the, reducing the bad stuff that we were doing in the marketplace. Today, the, the, the more progressive companies aren't thinking about circularity or sustainability in that way anymore. They're thinking about, because the, the, the problem of, the, of thinking about it that way is that you can never reduce yourself to some of the more ambitious goals that are out there, uh, uh, carbon neutrality or, or, or biodiversity. You, you can't get there by doing less bad things. What you have to do is actually reinvent your whole business model and, and turn your, 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 your business around in a different direction. And that involves um, radically rethinking the, the, the whole profitability model, the whole growth model, and, and, and the, the whole branding model of, of, of businesses. And, and so this is where the opportunity comes in for the, for the first movers and for the more nimble and the more progressive companies, because they get to define what that means. They get to define what that looks like, and they get to be the first mover. In, in, in that marketplace. And, and in that new marketplace, there are going to be clear winners and losers um, and not much in between. And so, so the, the advantage of moving quickly is that you, you want to make sure that you're part of that solution and you're driving that growth and, and, and that change. Thank you, Edwin. Um, so HK Vita works with a lot of brands and manufacturers to make this happen, right? So in your view, um, so is there already, a, we know there's a lot of movement on the ground in this, right? And we're moving towards that transition. Um, while we do that, it, one, is that speed good enough? But two, are these models that we work towards, is it scalable? Is it something that can you know, achieve what we're trying to achieve when it comes to the climate crisis and get everyone in the world of circular economy? Yeah, yeah. So, so to be, to be clear, HK Rita is an applied research center. We don't publish, and um, we don't work on very theoretical uh, um, uh, um, models. What we try to do is to get things in the marketplace as quickly as possible, and to produce as much useful services as possible. So, what we try to do is exactly to your point: is is not to satisfy our own intellectual curiosity. But we measure our, uh, our, our productivity and, and the work we do by how much we roll out in the marketplace, how, how can we impact the marketplace, and how quickly can we do that. And, and so today there is, there is a foot race to how do we scale these things, how do we industrial sc uh, scale these things, how do we uh, create these, uh, all the auxiliary things that has to happen to support uh, the, the, the scientific research. So what the business model looks like, what the logistics model looks like, uh, how do you communicate and talk about this effectively? So the, the, the types of technologies we develop, we, we think about all of those questions uh, in parallel to uh, when, when we do the, the, the scientific work around some of the solutions we, are, uh, we come up with. Thank you, Edwin. I think this opens the ground for some questions from the audience uh, in relation to what Edwin has laid the ground for. Also to know that, yes, um, you know, there is research being done. There are things out there that is clear indication of where we're heading. And one question is, which I'm going to open up to the panel and maybe Gwen, you can, you can start with the answer first. What are the top three factors that affect the business case for circular enterprise at early stage? Example, potential scale, policy environment, et cetera. Yes, I saw that one come through <laughs> and I felt like, uh, but I'm curious how the rest of the panel see that, that unless you kind of start to pin it down to a particular uh, aspect of circularity, 
the answers will be slightly different. You know, I like the way, um, Harsha, that you mentioned this space of raw materials production and then let's say the, the business model or the, the interaction with the customer. Because I think the factors will differ according to kind of what strategy you're trying to scale. Um, and some some of the uh, the ones that come to mind, I think that uh, that participant already started um, to mention around kind of the policy environment, etc. One thing I would say is, you know, not to underestimate in in all of this is the role of the user or the customer and their engagement from the beginning in also how you um, conceptualize or build whatever it is that you're trying to build, you know, involve, involving them from an early stage and it really in the problem identification and then in the development of the solution. For instance, when we were working with brands last year to develop these rental and resale models, the early stage concepts that we developed were entirely different from the concepts that we ended up uh, building into pilots after we had spoken to the customer about their pain points, their needs, their wants. Um, and I feel like oftentimes the customer is really left out of the innovation process um, and brought in later and expected to want whatever has been put to market. But can you involve your customer at an early stage? Because ultimately in a circular um, system, they are critical to success. I mean, for, for many of the circular strategies that we're trying to, to build and scale, they're the actual supplier to the system. Um, you know, when you talk about recycling, well, actually, where are we going to get that feedstock? Um, there you need the customer to bring the product back. Resale is the same, rental is the same. So how, I think, can you engage the customer from an early stage and also prove their interest, their buy-in? I think that will be a critical factor uh, for the business case, because at the end of the day, you need them to, um, to support what you're doing. But maybe I give the open the floor for other uh, key factors to the group. Yes, is there anyone else who'd like to answer on that? But I would also like to direct, uh, you know, based on what you said about the customer to Harsha back, because I said I was going to come back to you on, you know, when you talk about brands, manufacturers, and then the final customer, how does that work in terms of also, you know, it, how do you drive, uh, you know, innovations and partnerships and technologies, things that will take H&M to its vision, but at the same time, making sure that you're getting, you know, the kind of involvement that talks about scale, talks about, hey, this is a great ROI for manufacturers to win. And at the end of the day, customers want this and they're hurt. Harsha? Yeah, um, I mean, first to touch upon those uh, factors, uh, not just early stage, but for any stage, I would categorize them into three. Uh, one is a mindset shift. Uh, we have been working like this for I don't know, thousands of years. Uh, to, to shift that so quickly, uh, you have to change a lot of minds. Second thing is technology. Uh, we want to do a lot of things, but technology is not always with you, or we don't even know how to use that technology. That's where I think Edwin and Hong Kong Rita and, and organizations like that support uh, the industry. Uh, and the third one is the whole financial model around it. Uh, this, as Edwin again said, don't treat it as a sustainability initiative, uh, but treat it as a business initiative. And so if you get these three right, uh, I think these, these will be, uh, it will be easy to be successful. And when it comes to H&M's own journey and, and how we um, look at you know, customers and, and connection with customers, um, we have to look at customers in a different light now when it comes to circular business model. Uh, Set, customers are not there just to buy, uh, use, and dispose. If you get the circular business model right, uh, customers become part of your supply chain or value chain. You know they bring back products that you can recycle. So they they become almost like your suppliers at some stage, uh, and they become part of the journey that that product takes. Uh, for that, I mean, you have to have a different kind of communication. Uh, it's not enough to say how good our brand is uh, and, and, and promote sustainability just to bring more customers, but also to communicate how they can become part of this journey. 
I'm not saying we are there yet. I mean, it's, it's a lot of work that has to be done, but we have to look at customers in a totally different light, uh, not just treat them as somebody who pays for the product, but also treat them as somebody who contributes to the success of this model. Uh, and that is, I think, a lot of effort is being put in within H&M Group uh, to understand and, and to communicate in that way. Uh, but it, it is an industry level uh, you know, problem that, that we have to sort out and then everyone has to start uh, has to start doing it. Thank you, Harsha, for that. And uh, yes, I think uh, you, you brought up a very important point about customers become part of the value chain and it's important to consider them and look at them, also taking in line with what Gwen said. Uh, Dr. Rene, I want to talk to you about the policy environment. And one side, yes, we have the government and then we have, you know, different partnerships and collaborations and, you know, uh, different uh, important pieces along the supply chain. But then we have the policy environment. So how does that work for Unido when it comes to, uh, you know, the transition, especially when it's got to do with policy environment? I'd be happy to answer that, but I was really keen to also come in on the, on this notion of the business case. So if you allow me you know, to elaborate a little bit on that, so 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 because I think uh, the, it, it, it's a, there's no no one size fits all, and the, the the answers are rapidly evolving. And I think that if to, it is important that we bring some granularity around this. And to to me, and we we discussed this also in the preparatory call. This this comes around a number of questions, and then I think the first question is still what is the circular economy because it's it definitely means different things to different people. And many people are still in the perception that uh, circular economy is a recycling economy. And I think one would probably go further and say, well, as long as, as, long as we have recycling, which often means downcycling, we don't have circularity. So I think that this is important. You need to emphasize then that this is also a manufacturing economy. So that needs to be things made and, and transferred and, and put back and maybe we, we, we get we, we have some elements of innovation in there which is about the products the technologies but also the business models and consumption and lifestyle choices we have something which applies in different life cycle stages like uh, Asha was already referenced to the raw materials manufacturing and other stages uh, but and and we have the circular strategies basically so one is to cycle back which is uh, the, the resource circularity the other one is the efficiency one so that we basically have less stuff to recycle back in the end. And I think what is often some, sometimes we uh, overlook is the, the, the opportunity that is there with renewables. So the resource switch to things which we can basically cycle back into nature. So, so once we, we, we and, and maybe there's no one size fits all, so it would be fine, perhaps fine that different uh, organizations are working on the different parts of the, the circular economy transition in, in different uh, value chains or different market segments. That's, that's fine. Then the second question is a, bit, is a bit one on what is to be cycled. So we can talk in a, in a narrow way of just what is the textile fiber, the garment, or also the chemicals, water, and energy in, used in production or in the use and maintenance of the garments. Most, and I think if not need not all attention focuses on the textile fiber and indeed we do not we are not doing great there if you look at the uh, the uh and the Carter Foundation report, it says about two to three percent is recycled back into uh, textile fiber, isn't it? It might be three and a half percent, but it's it's bugger nothing, if I put it uh, uh, bluntly. Uh, in that, and then maybe it gets better if you look at some of the downcycling, but still, uh, that is uh, it, that is still a very low number. But uh, it's not only the the fabric. Uh, think about the accessories, the buttons, the zippers, the stickers, etc. Just the global zipper market is about is approximately seven million kilometers of zipper a year. That's once around the globe every two days or nine times a year back and forth to the moon. So this is huge amounts of what we can do. And then look at the water. So 20% of, indu of industrial wastewater is from the textile sector. So we need to, to get a more inclusive consideration of circularity that is not just about uh, my jeans, which I get back and, and are being reused or recycled, but whole, the whole circularity transition. Then the third element is, I, I guess, is the business, business case for Wu, And this reflects maybe I, am I the farmer, the raw material producer? Am I the recycler? Am I the, 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 the garment maker, the brand, the customer? And the challenge, I guess, is still that, that everybody is looking for a, a private benefit, whereas the, ultimately we, we're talking about the situation of creating shared benefit or shared values. And some, some uh, changes will happen there. So that, this is, and, and everyone can then focus on different parts. So what I was saying in my earlier intervention on the efficiency side is really something for the processes. 
And then, of course, it's the question, the big question is, is uh, what is the business case after all? So to the CFOs, chief financial officers, it would just be dollars and cents. But then often, and, and, but what, what, what does it mean? And you could, could really illustrate this question of what the, the proverbial question, what's the price of water? And then for, me, for many people, they would say, well, if you, water, if you can just pump it up, it's bugger nothing the cost, because it will just be the pumping cost. But if you have to pay for the treatment of the wastewater, it becomes another story. And what if there's no water available, uh, available and you have to stop production? So it's all a question of, uh, of perspective which we, uh, which we have there. Uh, and 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 it's uh, so so the question is really and and I think Hasha referred to that H uh, and M exists seventy five years and wants to be in business for another seventy five years so we can't just focus on today's profit and need to to uh, to to move forward clearly the, I think the writing is on the wall there's an urgency to act by trade and not by twenty fifty. Uh, by 2050, we need to have a uh, carbon neutrality, uh, but we need to see a transformation starting to show impact in the 2020s. So that's in the next, say, five, seven years. And all sectors are being uh, lined up to get carbon neutral and do deep decarbonization. So in mobility, it's addressed. In housing, it's addressed. In, in farming and, and other sectors, it will just be waiting when, when will uh, garments, apparel, fashion come in there. Um, and we might just, uh, what I also hear as an industry for is we might just want to learn from the COVID pandemic. I mean, if I would have talked here you had, uh, two years ago, nobody would have believed that uh, H&M stores would be largely closed for two months or even more in, in, in such a short notice. So, so we have all been caught by surprise, but we should not have been because there was enough warnings up front. Like now we see the same with uh, climate change. There's enough warnings are around. We need, need to, uh, to, to, to take responsibility. I, I guess that, that is the, uh, the point. We take responsibility for today's profit, but also for the sustainability of the of of the uh, of sustaining the markets the societies in which we operate uh, so i think that that, that, and that comes then also to the, the, the last point to of this taking responsibility i guess this is uh, this is a challenge still uh, and would be from a policy perspective important to do it's a huge industry 1.5 trillion dollars that is if it was a country it would be the 14th largest country in the world or the same size of australia and the GHG emissions of the sector are about 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions, so more from fashion than from uh, the aviation and maritime industry together. So these facts are just not known. People are just on the perception that, okay, it's only, it's only a cotton t-shirt or it's only my, my jeans which are there. And this message needs to get across to, to everyone, to the, whether it's a processor, cotton grower, or whether it's a consumer. Uh, and then, uh, the, then this needs to be translated. I think then the, there needs to be a two-pronged uh, strategy. One is, uh, um, I think uh, Edwin already referred to that. We need to push the, the front runners to run faster and further. Uh, so in innovation and experimentation as, as a corporate strategy rather than as a philanthropy or social responsibility initiative. But the other part, and that's maybe is, is not necessarily the popular side, is that we, we should also basically mop up the laggards, as I would say it. So there are still people who think that they can get away. And, and, and this is allowed so that you can still, uh, uh, so the sector as a whole is, is held back by operators and regulators. We have no interest beyond today. And they need to, 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 to work on this, this notion of having compliance with all the rules which we have, uh, uh, mandatory and, and not an elective issue. And I think that is really something that we need to work on all uh, brands, uh, uh, manufacturers, governments, but also the consumers. I think it's a question on on uh, on what what scenario do we want? Are we taking advantage? Are we taking looking forward and stay? We want to be in business, or are we waiting for the consumer to say, "No, I won't buy here because you're not doing enough." And we've seen we've seen enough of uh, consumer action. We've seen uh, uh, consumers and concerned citizens going to the courts to mandate companies like Shell to take more action on climate change. This will just uh, it might not happen today. It might not happen in 2022. But this is this is this is what is on the wall, and if we just look uh, put our head in the sand, we can just be now focused on the business case. But we need to really take responsibility. So there was a very long answer, but I think that uh, shares a little bit of a perspective on being granular and specific, taking responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rene. I think one important point stands out. It's just not the leaders in the industry that needs to be, you know, going towards this position, but 
everybody needs to come on and then this will work i think level the playing ground in your own words yes. i think in the yes in in the in the interest of time i see that we just have 10 minutes and i realize there's so many questions that we're running out of time but at this time i would like you know also something that the audience can you know some take away for the audience and to summarize uh, you know this whole conversation uh, point i would ask priya to start with that if you could provide some take away and also summarize this yes thank you and just maybe um one comment i don't think we should underestimate the effects of innovation because i totally agree with the policy framework and uh the government's role and everybody's role but we definitely need also to have space for innovation even if it's small but it's also a radical change in thinking which is very much required at the moment so um that's also actually why we support a lot of art initiatives because from art from culture that is where it actually starts also especially if you look at how the design sector develops and how the textile sector develops so i still think philanthropy in general has a very important role to play here um and of course i totally agree with everything what is said but um a business case is working on both sides so it's either from the perspective to have the ability for startups to scale up and also on the other hand for bigger brands and corporates to make the transition and also to give them some space to include it in their business case by applying just more true cost to pricing mechanisms i think that is also a very important line just to to mention um and and i also hope just a lot of other people will also feel the responsibility whether you're in consumer or anyone in the whole supply chain just to take action thank you freya edwin i would love to hear your uh, you know thoughts and especially something that the audience can take away with them yeah i was thank you and i was thinking about this in the context of where a lot of the opportunities lie and and uh Uh, we know that in in everybody's supply chain is where a lot of the uh, the challenges that we've all talked about uh, uh the op- where wastewater is being generated where where uh where where a lot of inefficiencies are being identified and where i think some of the the innovation and opportunities lie so so for for manufacturers and for um for people who are who are uh, working with other uh, partners in the supply chain what are some things that are useful to think about uh as we think about this topic and and so so some thoughts i mean the, the first one is I, i think it is important for us to 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 choose our partners wisely who do we do business with or who do we choose to do business with do these people align with our value system and our vision are they heading in the same direction that we want to go um and 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 then secondly sort of like a, like a, a, a an, as an inward uh, um, exploration is to think about what are the right things to do i think intuitively we we know a lot of what the right things to do and and how do we how do we uh, act on those uh, as opposed to the things that we can do is just these are the things that that we can sleep better at night these are things that we know will ensure a sustainable long future for our business for ourselves and for for our children so what what are those things and then think about things a little bit more long term uh because i think we shouldn't let accounting cycles or financial uh or or uh, uh conventions uh, drive our decision making and 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 drive our our our, our businesses a, a lot of what we uh, have to do uh, to your question earlier is i think we have to to clearly understand where we create value uh where we contribute to to um in in the supply chain that we operate in so today a lot of manufacturers are labor components of, of the supply chain and labor component supply chain unfortunately is a depreciating uh, uh value in the supply chain there's always another cheaper country somewhere in the third world that will that will that will provide the same labor so apart from being the labor component what are the services that you can provide that can create value for your customers warehousing distribution uh, i i was just in a, a supply chain meeting uh, earlier in the week in which everybody is is worried about the entire global supply chain how can we how can we help our our partners so that goods end up in the right place in the right marketplace that they are distributed properly that we don't make things that don't sell uh, a lot of the waste is created not 
uh, because uh, we are throwing things away. We are throwing thing, uh, things away quickly, but we are also creating things that customer don't want to pay. That it doesn't fit. It's not in the right color. It's not in the right marketplace. Um, and then finally, because I can go on, I, I think the, 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 another way to think about all that we've talked about today is that what choices do we have? And, and, and the choices are, are, are this, we can be victims, we can be bystanders, or we can be, be, we can be active participants in, in bringing solutions and new ideas to, this, uh, to, the, to the marketplace that we operate in. It's much better that we, that we are uh, actively in there trying new things all the time, because I, I think at the end of the day, that's how we're gonna get, uh, get through this very complex challenge. Thank you, Edwin. I lost you for a second there, but I, I guess you're done. I'm sorry if I missed a point, but you know, there's one thing that you know stood strong in what you said is about choosing your partner. Right, right, right. I, I think it, it is. It is still a very human uh, business that we're in, and and really do have to make sure that that we look at who is it that that we 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 choose to engage with. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. I guess my my internet is unstable. I missed a few points of what you said. Uh, but coming, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Can yeah, you hear me? Yeah, you're, can I you can hear you. Hear you. Oh, great. Thank you. I'm sorry about this. Uh, but one thing uh, which, which really stands out from what you said is also about choosing your partners and also to be arrogant about how you you know about it. Choose the right partners that align with you. I really like that statement, and I said I needed to say it today too. Thank you, Edwin, for that. And sorry about that little connection problem. I want to go back. I'm sorry, uh, I seem to be losing uh, connectivity, but very quickly, uh, Harsha, I want to come to you, uh, you know, about one quick question where one of the key pain points from manufacturers is while brands want to adopt circular solutions, very few are willing to invest in the same. It may not be the case uh, for H&M, but what do you think, what would it take for brands to invest in circular solutions? I know the writing is on the wall, but uh, the real scenario is very few are willing to invest in the same. I think uh, in the question itself, maybe we are getting confused here with circularity with CSR. Uh, yeah. I mean, this old way of thinking where brands ask for something but don't pay for it. When it comes to circularity, brands have to invest because they see benefit of investing in it. If they don't invest, they can't really get to that circular solution. Uh, and that means they will not really benefit from whatever comes out of it. Um, I think what is important here is uh, what Edwin mentioned, choosing the right partners, but also having that conversation about how each one of us can benefit from this. Mm. I think there is a case for manufacturers that even if brands don't ask for it, they might have their own business case and why they should be doing it. And they should be investing their own money. And that's where it's very important to differentiate circularity with other CSR related uh, initiatives, because this is very powerful tool, uh, which can be profitable as well. It's not just about taking responsibility and being good for the world. Uh, and uh, if, if it, there's one takeaway for audience, I think everybody should learn a bit more about circularity. Get into it, ask more questions, ask, uh, try to understand what is circularity for you. Uh, everybody has a role to play and everybody will benefit from circularity. So a bit more time into it and maybe longer discussion with, with experts would really help. Thank you, Harsha. I think uh, for the audience, we, I, I think we should call you in for another session also from a brand point of view to talk about what circularity actually means. We'll take you on that later, Harsha. Thank you. Gwen, uh, any, uh, you know, as we move towards the end of this, we'd love to hear if there is anything for as a takeaway for the audience and also to summarize this, any points from you. Yeah, I, I just want to kind of echo what I've heard so far. I think Edwin's point on um, choosing your partners is a really valuable one. I just extend that to also think about not only, you know, the, your, in a supplier kind of client relationship, but also your peers and how can you build a network kind of horizontally and start to think, move towards that more collective benefit versus private benefit that, that Rene spoke about. There's so much to learn from having that peer um, connection. 
And and the point that I was missing in the conversation, but Harsha just brought it up, is the capacity building. So, you know, we're we're in a little bit of a bubble always on this topic. And how do you actually build that foundational knowledge and understanding of the circular economy within your organization? Just even the simplicity of having everyone using the same words and the same language and, you know, understanding and being able to differentiate. But what do we mean when we talk about high value textile to textile recycling versus open loop, closed loop? I mean, there's such a lingo around this topic and make it very difficult to penetrate. And just having that foundational understanding, building some basic capacity and understanding within the team, um, I think is a great first step and will really stand to you. Uh, to be able to engage in a more meaningful way in the space. Thank you for that, Gwen. And Dr. Rene, I know you've given us very detailed and intense information. Is there something that you would like to leave us with? No, it's, it's, I think the, 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 the main point remains of uh, pushing harder for this innovation. And I think that it's really uh, emphasized by, uh, by different partners that we, we should encourage the innovators to go faster and, and, and further ahead beyond their uh, imagination and take it and also as a core strategy. So not just a, so, something which is happening in a corner of the business, but something which can be mainstreamed there. And then I, as I come back to the, the level playing field, which you were also highlighting that uh, this is important. I think that the, the financial aspect and so on will come a bit uh, once these uh, elements are, are pushed there. The, the business case will clear up once we drive harder for innovation, once we drive harder for a, a level playing field, because these are all factors which are influencing a business case in a narrow sense and a business case in an extended sense, which is more based on responsibility. Thank you, Dr. Rene. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we've come to the end of the panel discussion. Thank you so much. I think the things that resonate are we need to, you know, choose our partners, be arrogant about that. You know, when it comes, we need investors to take more risk and invest in early stage innovations and, you know, technologies, level the playing field. Um, you know, involve uh, customers as part, I mean, they are part of the, you know, the, the value chain. So I think all this resonates with us and they're great takeaways that we have. And I think for NU2, as we build, you know, one of the insights is as we build scalable and profitable ventures in um, circularity, one thing we, we know that makes us as, you know, a great track record building these ventures is collaboration and partnerships. So I think I'll leave with that uh, thought and uh, Nancy and um, Siddharth, back to you. Uh, thank you so much, Gigi, uh, for that. And thank you so much, uh, panelists, for the very insightful discussion. Um, I think one of the points that came up today was the innovation and the importance of pushing for innovation. And uh, we do have two very promising circular innovations today with us. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce the first one. Um, KB Color Sciences, uh, which is deeply committed to reducing the ha uh, harmful effects of uh, chemicals. Um, they use microbial uh, microbial dyes, and uh, they want to change the landscape of dyeing in the apparel industry. Uh, we have Dr. Vaishali Kulkarni from uh, KB Call Sciences. Uh, Vaishali will be shortly coming to you um, after we uh, play the video with the questions from the panel and the audience. Chemical Sciences Private Limited. To start with, we all know the problem with chemical colors. Nancy, we're not able to hear. I'm not sure about the rest. Nancy, are you facing a technical difficulty from your side? Um, so yeah, we cannot hear you. We cannot hear the video. Sorry, you can't hear the video. Sorry, I didn't get that. Yeah, we can't. We can't. Yes. Um, let me try and play it again. Sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Vaishali Kulkarni, founder of Chemical Sciences Private Limited. To start with. We all know the problem with chemical colors, 
continuous use of chemical colors has not only affected humans, but uh, they have also known to cause pollution. Hence, there is a huge revolution coming. Uh, various brands, retailer and manufacturer, they are looking for greener alternatives. So, what solution can KB Calls offer? KB Calls are producing natural colors through small living organisms, especially microbes. We are exploring a rich Indian biodiversity. We explore various soil, air, water samples, and we extract colors through that biomass. And this is how the final product looks like. The final product is water soluble, free of microbes, and it is a non-GMO product. We have just not produced these colors, but we have also shown its application in textile free, uh, field. And this is how the dyed fabric looks when dyed with chemicals color. Our fabric has been showcased in Material Collection Library, New York. In one slide, if I have to summarize chemicals impact, this would be the slide. Here you can see the original dye solution, and this is after dyed solution. This is completely colorless, which means the dye uptake has been more than 95%. This is the dyed fabric. The, this dye uptake is uh, hardly even possible with chemical colors or uh, vegetable colors. And we are not using any volatile chemicals in production. And the temperature for production is hardly 37 to 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, with this impact, chemicals has gained uh, traction in fashion technology and today we are doing piloting uh, with various luxury brands in Europe, India and Japan. Talking about chemicals recognition in technological space, chemicals was incorporated in 2018 uh, and today uh, we have our own lab of 2000 square feet in Pune. In the end, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome any brand or manufacturing partner who would like to pilot with KB Calls. We have a phase-wise uh, approach in which phase one would be initial testing of colors and performance of colors. If it is satisfactory with the company, we will go with the phase two, where industrial testing and bulk scale will be tried. And if that is approved, then we will go for the phase three, where market entry would be planned for a small capsule collection. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Vaishali, for that. I'll request you to turn on your video. Um, and uh, the floor is open to panelists if they have any questions. And also, audiences, you can type in your questions in the chat box. Um, Nancy, can I start with my question? Please, Arsha, go ahead. Uh, so, Vaishali, just one question. It looks amazing uh, and something as an industry we need. Um, what is your biggest challenge right now to scale it up, to take it to really commercial level in the next couple of years? What is stopping you? Thank you. Thanks, Nancy, for the introduction. Uh, thanks, Arsha, for the question. Uh, the biggest challenge for us is the shade limitation. Since uh, we are at a very young stage, so finding microbes of various colors and combining them into the uh, getting various shades is a big challenge for us. And the second challenge uh, for us is the scale up, scaling of the technology to, as you see, the coloring is a very big uh, market. So the demand and supply gap is huge. So the scale up is also a challenge for us. Okay, thank you. Uh, we can we can stay in touch. Uh, we can talk offline later. Sure, sure. Yeah, happy to connect. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, can can I uh, come in because I, I think it's a really interesting uh, prospect. But uh, which which uh, fibers or processes are you specifically targeting for? Is this something for the natural fibers or is this for polyester, nylon? Uh, how how do you see the applications? 
Uh, we have tried almost uh, every fabric ranging from color, cotton, silk, even rainy fabric, polyester also we have tried, tried. And the colors are going very well on almost all the fabrics which we have tried. And uh, just to talk about polyester, polyester is generally dyed at 130 degrees Celsius. But with our technology, we have also managed to reduce down that temperature to 85 degrees. So even like uh, we can uh, reduce the temperature and energy consumption required to dye those fabric as also we have seen that possibility. Gigi, Gwen, any questions from your side? Please? Quick question, uh, Vaishali. I missed that part. Uh, I mean, my internet uh, was a little unstable. I just want to know, you said you're, you've already piloted this, right? And I just want to know uh, your... Ha who have you piloted with in the sense that has there been a brand interaction just to know, uh, you know, to understand one is, uh, you know, Hasha said the challenges of scale. Yes. But, but what would it actually take? So what are the results right now? What, what is it that, uh, where are you right now is what I want to know. So right now we are actually we are doing phase wise uh, pilot, as I mentioned in the slide, uh, various phases first giving the colors. First, the, in the company, we'll identify whether the colors are matching their performance or not. And then there would be a bulk trial in phase two. Phase three will be like at industrial scale, launching a capsule collection. So we have almost clear phase one, and we are about to start phase two with the uh, various luxurious brand, more uh, their luxurious brand in Europe. So due to confidentiality agreement, we are not supposed to take their names. Yes, but right now we are at pilot uh, phase two, you can say, with them. Great. So we are supplying them colors in bulk and they are trying it. Yeah. Thank and, you. Sir. Yeah. We'll be in touch. Sure, yeah. Happy to connect that. Um, do we have any other questions from our panelists? Um, Edwin, do you have any questions? Edwin Gwen, uh, do you have any questions from you? Um, yeah, uh, could you give me a little bit of an idea of the, um, have you done a cost benefit analysis and, and how competitive this is? Yeah, uh, yes, we have studied cost uh, analysis. We are uh, actually a bit higher compared to chemical colors. We cannot match with chemical colors. Uh, but what uh, we are uh, targeting is now we are trying to use waste agriculture media for our production, which will lower down the cost. And today we are quite comparable to floral and vegetable colors, which are already in the market. But coming to chemical colors, Still, we have to do a lot of research to match with chemical colors. Yes, but here I am not including the after treatment cost, which is incurred by chemical colors. When they release the dyed water in uh, dyed water into the water streams, they have to do many unit operations. So that additional cost is I am not taking into the account. Our colors are totally biodegradable. So they will have to do minimal, uh, minimal you can say, minimal treatment to release that water into the water uh, streams. And even the, as you can see the picture uh, from our slide, the exhaustion, the dye exhaustion is pretty good. It's more than 95%. But the end product uh, is almost colorless solution what we get with our colors. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to another innovation we have for today, um, Promethean Energy, which is building some cutting edge technology in waste heat, re heat recovery systems. And um, by this, we end up saying, saving fuel and hence uh, reducing our carbon footprint. Uh, we have the founding member from Promethean Energy today with us, Mr. K.P. Ashwin. Um, uh, Ashwin, I'll request you to take the questions from panelists and audience, post this video. Yes. One. Over sixty percent of the input energy in the textile factory. Rejected as waste. 
for helping reduce fuel consumption and improve circular manufacturing we build heat recovery systems some examples include heat recovery from air compressors where over 60% of the input energy can be recovered back as hot water and reused within the facility in the wet processing section we have also engineered and built a dyeing effluent heat recovery system to simultaneously reduce the coal consumption in the dyeing sector while also reducing the effluent tank temperatures all of these have led to over 300 to 500 tons of carbon emission savings per year apart from heat recovery systems we also work on digitizing factories particularly with raymond we have worked on a whole set of applications including monitoring of compressors finishing equipment humidity steam traps oil heaters hydrants among others all of these projects involve setting up remote non intrusive sensors which can be rapidly deployed or battery powered with long lifetimes and long ranges all of these can be monitored securely remotely with intelligent insights into the system and timely alarms and alerts we are one of the leading manufacturer of mustard soap in this time business and here we always focus on the efficient processes for manufacturing the fabric and the best cost in this type type of processes we are uh, very much helpful for the sustainable projects we have completed it is all the complication of ai iot and digitalization all projects are basically helping the software engineers to the plant at level person to make decisions on the real time basis um ashwin can i request you to please turn on your video and uh, if you have any questions from the panelists and the audience uh, feel free to type in and unmute yourself in the edwin i see you've unmuted yourself so uh, please go ahead yeah congratulations on a, on a, on a very useful uh, product and service could you give me an idea of what the roi looks like uh yeah hi um yes yeah, so that i don't... okay sure Uh, yeah, hi, Edwin. Uh, yeah, so uh, we work with the manufacturing uh, in the entire supply chain. Our focus is on the manufacturing um, piece of the overall supply chain. Uh, and here, in the, especially in the textile spaces, given the margins are not too great, uh, we really cannot work with products which have long ROIs. So every solution, whether it be a heat recovery system or a digital solution. all of them need to have very well defined roi's and uh, the maximum roi that any of a product has is around 2 years uh, 24 months is the max 12 months also thank you maybe i can jump in uh, ashwin thanks for your presentation and seems like you have quite a lot of buy in and support already from large industry players so wondering what is the biggest uh, challenge for you guys at the moment and where is the the need uh, okay so there are few challenges actually uh, so one of the challenge is on accept- acceptability of innovation i would say most of the products that we have would be fairly innovative or has low precedence in the market before this and uh, there is uh, less appetite for trying on new solutions uh, by the manufacturing space uh, without significant precedence of such solutions existing mm. uh, some programs like uh, unido uh, renewable team they do provide projects uh, they do provide grant funding for deploying such projects like the heat recovery solution from dyeing effluent that i showcased that was supported by the unido by one of the unido projects it has amazing paybacks i would say less than one year roi uh, but yet no industry was willing to pilot it and it was only through this proof of concept funding that uh, this could really take off uh, so i would say low acceptability of innovation is one 
second is maybe uh, capital budgets are hard to come by in the textile space uh, and sustainability energy efficiency come uh, not on the top 5 to 10 priorities for a for a factory a factory who which is set up to to maximize productivity to maximize production uh, on the head of the plants priority list energy efficiency or sustainability especially doesn't come in the top 5 list i would say uh, and hence allocating budgets for setting up new systems uh, that becomes a bit of a challenge we are trying to get around this by doing some esco models where we say that we will invest the entire capital and then if the savings come in then we will recover it from there uh, how that has its own challenges also but i would say these are the two main challenges that we see um, an acceptance of innovation or like limited acceptance to innovation and second uh, sustainability circularity all these things not being a top priority for a manufacturing company thank you thank you yeah can i come in ashwin it's uh, nice to see you uh, and uh, Hi, it's, it's good to see that over the years you have come uh, much further and i i i maybe wanted to uh, you because we've spoken about this in the past but i think you have a product which is not necessarily new ip or so but it is more like applying common sense there's no new thermodynamics involved in it the thermodynamics are the same but you are smarter in dealing with this thermodynamics so so how do you see that and how do you then also see your opportunities to grow as a business and 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 is there a business case for you to, in that sense or can others easily catch up with the, the same knowledge what is your perspective on that uh, uh, reni i would say one the market is too large uh, so in fact even if 15 new people are doing the same thing there will still be a large market and if you spend so the people we are working with are the best in the industry they are not like uh, people non engineers who have just put together machines and are producing these are people who are uh, as in the factories we work with they are very high up on the engineering scale and yet yeah. when we visit there we see that there is so much opportunity for efficiency improvement not only on energy but also on circularity of water there is possibility of reducing waste of textile in the manufacturing space uh, there is a lot of opportunity this is in the best best uh, factories i would say so i would say that uh, the upside for improving efficiency in factories is really uh, there is significantly there uh, once that right ecosystem etc comes into place and hence i would not say that we really need uh, really cutting edge ip i would say just having getting together good solutions put together putting together on a in the right framework can yeah. really lead to a lot of uh, uh, yeah. savings in the manufacturing space at least Yeah, yeah, that's true, and in that sense, it's uh, it's also co-creation of solutions. Then, isn't it specifically for a specific manufacturing setup? So, so thank you, and and good luck with the and expanding your business. That would be good for the planet. With us. thanks, Rani. Thanks, Rani. Uh, thank, thank you so much for that. Uh, you know, I do realize that we are uh, you know just going slightly running closer to you know ending time, but uh, would love to invite you know a couple of comments from uh, you know any of you in terms of from the panel. you know your advice really to entrepreneurs in the circular economy space and not just you know kb colors and pramitya who been gracious enough to you know showcase the solutions here but uh, you know any any advice even to the entrepreneurs out there uh, in terms of what would it take for them to you know really ensure that their solutions are adopted and can be scaled from the industry thanks to that i'd like to take a go at that and actually uh, also looking at uh, you know vaishali and ashwin you know when it comes to being circular entrepreneurs and uh, it, it is it is difficult and it's a tough world and in the morning i, I you know in the morning session that uh, kf had an anki from nvu had said that one being a circular entrepreneur in circular economy a new economy is really tough and try that in a developing economy that's even tough you have a lot more i think something that i would leave you all with is partnerships collaborations i mean that is what will work and my question to ashwin and vaishali would be that uh, you know with the challenges that you have mentioned about you also have to you know see who you can collaborate and partner with because i understand you know being in this space it's not always that you can do it alone the road is tough but then you have different you know you have kf i mean you heard about all what the panel panelists say and and i think these are uh, you know organizations and people you can collaborate with so reach out so i think that would be key that i would leave you with Harsha, anything from a brand perspective that like you you'd like to share with them? 
I mean, I would say that um, you know, in the past, uh, startups were constantly looking for partnerships with, with brands and, and others. But now, I think they are in a good space. I mean, these are the kind of innovations where industry needs. So I'm sure there'll be more demand for them, and there will be brands and other investors chasing them. Uh, we have been chasing a lot of uh, startups uh, just to invest because we see big business case. Uh, so it's a good time to be uh, having innovations connected to circularity. Um, and I'll definitely reach out to uh, Ashwin and Vaishali and, uh, and others who are, uh, who are uh, in this call, please reach out to me and there are definitely possibilities to collaborate. Thank you. Thank you for that, Asha. When your thoughts, you know, coming from an entire ecosystem perspective again, uh, you know, any thoughts from your side? Well, maybe just to pick up on um, a comment made by, by one of the innovators around the value that came from the UNIDO engagement and, you know, that there's also a huge um, opportunity in non-commercial uh, collaborations or partnerships and looking towards potential public funding or philanthropic funding in early stages can give you the boost um, to get a proof of concept out and uh, and so on. So I would just say that, you know, there there is a lot of, um, yeah, uh, alternative funding models that you should also be looking into. It's not only the, for instance, brand engagement that will get you there. Great. Uh, we would love to get your thoughts. And uh, in fact, we are working for Mithyan as well as Kiwi Colors as far as project is, but we'll love to get your thoughts and advice for them. Thank you. Yes, very interesting. And of course, for us, it seems already quite a, a well-developed phase that they're in. So it would be a little bit different than what we see in general of the innovators that we support. So um, I, I agree with what was already said. I think the challenge, of course, is then how to scale up and who do you need and also, are you, uh, are you able to have um, the time to invest in it and also to get the support that mainly the pre-financing of those kind of pilots will come probably from the startup side and not very often from the brand. So it all comes back again to where do you get this patient capital from and are there others, maybe other stakeholders that are willing to, to support this kind of space for experiments because that is what's needed before you can really, you know, be attracted also by other formal investors or other impact investors. Got so it. it's probably one of the main challenges at the moment. Got it. Well, thank you so much. And Edwin, your uh, you know, suggestions and uh, you know, advice for the entrepreneurs that showcase as well as those in the audience. Well, I want to congratulate everybody uh, for, for coming up with great ideas. And, and I want to compliment everybody who are spending their time and effort on, on uh, driving some of these improvements to sustainability. Uh, I can't think of a more fun, exciting, better way to spend my days than, than to work on these types of solutions. Um, I, I think for, for things to scale and to be successful, you do have to begin by asking what is the problem that you're trying to solve? Uh, why should this have a priority over, over others? Uh, but then also be able to articulate the business case, which is how does this drive growth? How does this drive profitability? How does this drive market share for the, for the investor and for the brand who, who is interested in, in, in uh, what you're doing? And then to be able to have these answers and, and speak in, in language and uh, vocabulary that is understandable to the people that you want to attract, I think is quite important. Uh, I, again, I go back to the point, point about choosing a partner. Everybody has money. Whose money do you want to take? And, and make sure that, that you, you are. Uh, and, and why do you want to take this uh, partner up with whoever this investor uh, or, or partner is? Uh, because I, I think um, it, it is important to, to, uh, to, to have longer conversations and discussions about that. Uh, and, and then finally, resilience. Um, a lot of great ideas uh, are in the wrong place at the wrong time or, or just not make the right connections or the connections take a lot longer than we initially anticipated uh, it to take. Uh, a lot of times it's it, it, in, in, in our research experience, it's not the best scientific idea that, that makes it. It's the, it's the most comprehensive, the more, more holistic idea that's, that, that addresses the economics, the, the, the supply chain, the business model. And those are the ones that, that, that make it. 
And, and so think broadly uh, and, and uh, just have a lot of confidence in what you're doing and, and be very resilient. Um, with with uh, with this, it's it's uh, uh, it's it's a uh, uh, it's a big marketplace. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, lastly, but definitely not the least, uh, Dr. Rene would love to get your thoughts. And you know, thank you so much. We've been able to uh, you know surface uh, from Ethan at least from the FLCD facility that Unido had developed. So, but your advice for uh, you know the entrepreneurs here. Yes, yes. So, so, so FLCTD, Facility for Low Carbon Technology Development, is the program which Ashwin uh, participated in. And this is a program which currently has about 50 entrepreneurs in there. And uh, I, in different uh, domains uh, like waste heat recovery, space conditioning, uh, in, industrial IoT, and so on. So, it's, it's, it's one example. I, I, I think it's a, an example where, where it shows that it's, it's, a, it, is, it is, in part, it is the uh, giving a little bit of uh, patient capital or, or even grants uh, to, to do some experiments implementation, which is important. But what the feedback we get from uh, the, the different innovators that we have worked with over the past couple of years is also that it's not only the money that matters, it's also the the, the issues that uh, different organizations can help with an in industry introduction. So we have different partnerships where we try to introduce, uh, to, to bring an innovator to a company that might benefit from its application and might, might be willing to, to put a little bit of uh, a bit of its own uh, um, uh, intellectual capital in that so that is in the industry connect is, is very important and also i would say the uh, the uh, little bit of the uh, the call it an engineering review or our uh, improvement of the the innovations which are there because we have seen also some innovations where you say oh it's a great idea but uh, maybe there are some some aspects which have been overlooked and uh, and so on so i think it's it is uh, it, it and which has resulted in then improved designs or even in some some innovations and failing and saying no we can't engineer it so that's also fine so innovation is not only about success is also ruling out things which basically in practice cannot work so i think it's we should not just focus on the on the financing and the, the capital it, it's really about uh, uh, bringing people who, who can have a, a, a different perspective on the innovation and come from a different side who can really add value in that sense uh, i come back to the word of the co-creation of uh, solutions which is more and more important so i leave it there thank you Siddharth. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we owe short time a little bit, but you know, thank you so much for your insights. Really appreciate it. And uh, you know, for our panelists, uh, you know, it meant a lot to us that you came and you know, gave us such a, a you know strong perspective. Uh, we look forward to working with you all and you know trying to ensure that uh, you know some of these solutions can be adopted and scaled uh, by the industry. Uh, for can I can I add one thing, Siddharth? Uh, yes. We must congratulate CIF team as well. To connecting this dot because there are a lot of innovations happening all around the world but what we are missing is a forum that we can have these kind of discussions and bringing them up and, and connecting different parts of the value chain and you guys are doing excellent work so i just wanted to end with that thank you so much everyone thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.